Okay, so uh, we're here to talk about building a GraphQL API gateway the hard way. Uh, ideally, so you don't have to. Uh, so I think probably it makes sense to start from the beginning. So we're going to take a walk through um, an evolution of, of a service stack. And hopefully it'll sound kind of familiar to folks who have done this or folks who have seen this, um, because it kind of reminds me of my own experiences. Um, all right, so that is going to have to go this way. All right, so uh, we've got an idea for app. Uh, how do we run it? Uh, generally starts with a client and a server. And with this you know, humble little setup, you start to find your uh, initial product market fit and uh, get your foot in the door as a business. Uh, and so once you do this, your business starts to grow. And then you might find that you've got multiple services. Um, and so with multiple services, you might be splitting up maybe a monolith, you might be adding a new team, um, or you might be doing something else entirely. Uh, and from there, with two services and users, you start to think about maybe I should do auth the same way. You might not, but it is probably a good idea. Uh, and so well, you're think while you're thinking about that, all of a sudden you've got two clients. And this is, you know, as you grow, you get mobile apps, you get uh, web apps, uh, IT, IoT devices, TV apps, you name it. Um, and, it's because, and because it's a business, not many businesses, these tend to request similar data. Um, and they might, and there's a lot of overlap. Uh, so they'll be asking your services for this data. They'll be the cross chatter kind of going all over the place until you decide, okay, well, let's consolidate this and uh, put all that chatter into a single place. So you create an API layer. Um, so the clients you have are no longer doing orchestration on their own. Uh, they're going to the, the API layer to do this orchestration for them. Um, and this is you know, a great pattern up until the time where one of your clients is, says, I want this data in a slightly different way. Um, and this will happen when you know, you've got different devices that have different visual real estate, different network, networking requirements, uh, and uh, just different computational resources altogether. Um, and so you split your API into two layers, and now you've got chatter again. Um, and if you squint kind of close, this is actually a back end for front end pattern. Uh, so, with clients requesting different uh, forms of data, um, and you're gonna you're gonna end up with a BFF for pretty much every case that breaks the mold of your API layer. Um, it might be not be wholly the case, but it, this it starts to look appealing after a, a certain point in time. Um, and so, you know, we'll skip uh, skip ahead a little bit. Um, uh, once you've got your BFF, you might realize that like, you need a firewall, you've got custom domain names, caching, CDN things. And ultimately, there's a lot of stuff that goes into running a service stack. Um, and on top of that, you've got load balancing, API docs, uh, API discovery, service orchestration. It's not everything and uh, probably won't be. So. Um, Talk about wrangling that and make it a, making it a little simpler. Um, so one of the things we can do to specifically solve for that BFF problem is pull in GraphQL. And this is, this is the tool we use to um, you know, consolidate our APIs and uh, do the thing it promises to do, which is give you nothing more, nothing less. And uh, that reduces the, the amount of... Um, uh, a complication it, it, it takes to build out the, these front ends. Um, you don't need a whole set of, uh, you, you don't need a team for each back end for front end. You don't need separate applications. And so you can go to, um, you know, you, your, your life gets simpler. Um, but with, with a GraphQL uh, back end for front end effect, effectively, uh, you, you might have hand stitched this yourself or written this yourself. Um, if you didn't, that's that's really great. Um, but there's uh, 
you know, a lot of folks will start that way. Um, and from there, you end up with this lockstep pattern between your service teams and your API layer. Uh, and that service teams want to launch a feature, so your API team, API layer team needs to uh, work with them to get this out the door. So they need to update the API. Um, and so it's a lockstep process. So there's a solution for that too. And that's where um, you know, Apollo Federation and the router binary come in. Uh, so instead of handwriting this GraphQL API, you can rely on uh, GraphQL or Apollo Federation to compose your schema uh, into a super graph, load that into the binary, and then all you have to worry about is, is running the router. Uh, there's no, uh, no API layer team that has to write this from scratch, uh, and you get to go forward as just you know, operating the thing. Um, but before we talk about running it, it's probably worth uh, talking about like, you know, one of the small details about running an API gateway, which is AuthN and AuthZ. Uh, so AuthN is who you are as a user, and authorization is what you can do as a user. These are usually pretty important parts of an API gateway. Um, so it turns out the router can help solve for these two. So one with coprocessors, you can offload uh, your user identity and token enrichment to your coprocessor and build out um, you know, who I am as part of your request. And with AuthZ directives, you can guard your schema resources using that information uh, so that uh, you don't have to bake bespoke policies for AuthZ into your services or service mesh or wherever it is that you do it. It's all part of your schema as a declarative process. All right, so back to running the router. So even with your schema being offload, offloaded to service teams and AuthNZ solutions out of the box, you still might have to worry about deploying the router, making sure it gets through your CI CD process step by step and validating it through the process, scaling it both horizontally and vertically, uh, knowing what width and height is best for your workload, and maintaining it, so staying on top of new versions, features, security updates, et cetera, and then also making sure the environment it runs in is secure, it's got the right network policies, sandboxing, and controls. So, we're aiming to help with all of that as well. Uh, and this is where GraphOS Cloud comes in and Jack comes in. Uh, so if you all will give Jack a round of applause as he comes in. <laughs> Brian, a uh, huge shout out to Brian. Brian is one of the tech leads working on our cloud team uh, and has been instrumental in uh, cloud dedicated and serverless uh, coming to market. And so thank you, Brian. Um, awesome, so yesterday I talked a little bit, very high level about uh, cloud dedicated, and I'd love to dig in a little bit more and share some more details. So our mission with GraphOS Cloud is to help you scale and operate at a federated graph without managing additional infrastructure, and along the way, solve some of those API gateway challenges that Brian touched on earlier. Here's a new diagram on our, our brand new homepage, which I love. It shows how with GraphOS Cloud, we're now sitting in between your clients and your subgraphs and providing a, a layer to run your super graph for you. It extends the existing uh, graph registry and insights and delivery pipeline, and it really is a more holistic solution for operating a super graph at scale. So GraphOS Cloud is three things. It's fully managed infrastructure, it's our studio management plane, and it's an advanced GraphOS runtime. That advanced GraphOS runtime is features you've heard a ton about this week, like federated subscriptions, coprocessor, authentication, and authorization. We have two flavors of GraphOS Cloud. One is serverless, which we launched a year ago. It's a great way to get started. Most serverless users are new to federation or migrating an existing federation project. And whether you're building a proof of concept or moving an existing workload, it's an, it's an awesome place to get started. It's very cheap, and for most customers, it's free. But customers came to us and said, hey, I want to run a super graph at scale. I want more router performance and more throughput. One of the things about serverless is it scales to zero after a period of inactivity, and so customers said, I want, I want lower latency, I don't want to wait for a warm-up time like I see on serverless. So one of our missions with Dedicated was to create an always-on router fleet while still being fully managed. Serverless runs out of US Central, and customers said, my subgraphs are running somewhere else, maybe even in multiple regions, and I want to reduce round-trip latency. 
Uh, they go and read our Apollo router docs, and they're super excited to use features like traffic shaping or observability with things like Datadog. And so they want those features and dedicated as well. And then they wanted extended data retention and priority support to support them as they monitored their graphs and went into production. So that's where GraphOS Cloud Dedicated comes in. It's always on, provisioned ahead of time capacity that runs near your subgraph, subgraphs and has support for all Apollo router features. I showed this diagram earlier, but serverless, like I said, ran in US Central. And when you have a query plan that's resolving across multiple subgraphs, there's a round trip every time between the query planner and your subgraphs. So getting your query planner in the router closer to your subgraphs is critical for performance. So with dedicated, it all runs in the region of your choice. We're launching with support on AWS to begin. Uh, support for any compute resource, whether this, this is lambdas, ECS clusters, or EC2 instances. And what's great about this is even the most complex queries can be fast, both because you can control the scale of dedicated and because it's running near your subgraphs. So like I said, it runs in the, in the same region as your subgraphs. It's available today in US East 1, EU West 1, and EU Central 1, with more regions coming soon. Just request it. It's very easy for us to get in new regions. It's HA by default as it runs in at least uh, two AZs, and it's dedicated and isolated to you. Something we haven't talked about publicly yet is how dedicated works. Dedicated is built around a concept of graph compute units, or GCUs, and this is the throughput capacity of your fully managed fleet of Apollo routers. It does not correspond to the number of machines or containers or their size, but we guarantee an amount of throughput for your GraphQL workload. What's great about this is you just focus on the performance you need without worrying about the underlying infrastructure. We've run about 80 load tests against GCUs with different types of query complexity, subgraph latency, response sizes to provide a general profile for GCU throughput. A GCU can generally handle 25 supergraph requests per second, up to 150 subgraph fetches per second, and half a megabyte of response size. If you need more supergraph RPS, you would add more GCUs, or maybe you have really large queries that are slower and you can use a GCU how you see fit. Let's run through some examples. The x-axis on these graphs could be a week, a month, or a year. But in customer A's scenario, they're using the built-in observability features of Apollo Router and the new GCU usage metrics in Studio, and they're scaling up dedicated with their traffic spikes. They see fantastic performance, and clients do not see increased latency. Customer B, however, uh, has a spike in traffic. Maybe it's a Super Bowl ad or an exciting sale. And they start to approach some throttling. Now, this isn't brittle. GCUs do include a healthy amount of burst capacity, but there will be a point when you run out of performance and dedicated will return 429 errors to your clients. Your clients might be able to retry a few seconds later or a second later for the request to go through, or in a worst case scenario, some requests might get dropped. Let's touch on security. Uh, dedicated securely connects to your subgraphs with AWS VPC Lattice. Uh, which is a zero trust declarative way to do VPC peering. Uh, just as a call out, if, if you prefer other forms of VPC peering, I would love to hear about it, but we've been really happy with the performance from Lattice. Uh, you can also bring uh, JOT claim validation uh, to router, uh, the existing uh, JOT claim validation features you've been hearing about this week. Or if you're not ready to go that route and, or you have a different authentication scheme, you can use coprocessor and write a sidecar service of your choice. Uh, and just like the rest of GraphOS and Apollo, uh, we're working on SOC 2 Type 2 certification for cloud, and the Apollo router has been audited by Doyensec. Most importantly, uh, you can export router traces and metrics to Datadog, uh, other APMs, or OpenTelemetry, uh, and support for logs is coming soon. You also get all of the features of the Apollo router ops free. This includes uh, commercial features uh, that, have, that have previously required an enterprise license, like federated subscriptions, persisted queries, coprocessor, authentication, or schema authorization. We have other commercial features coming later this year, and one of the fantastic parts about Dedicated is that you're always getting the latest version of Apollo Router, unless you need to pin it to a different version. And so you'll be able to get access to these features very quickly. And so again, whether that's a POC or you're already in production, it's a great way to add new features to your SuperGraph. We have a Terraform module for Dedicated to quickly provision AWS Lattice in your AWS environment. This helps you get up and running very quickly. Uh, and we're working on Terraform support for more parts of Dedicated as well. Um, Brian and I will be outside after the talk uh, to answer more questions, but I'm going to attempt a live demo, so we'll see how that goes. Um, one second.
I realize my screen is mirroring and I need to, or not mirroring and I need to mirror it. Okay, excellent. So we'll start uh, in VS Code. And you can see here, I have a very basic uh, Terraform script. I'm pulling in the AWS provider. I want a provision in US East 1. And then we support today Lambdas or ECS clusters. You can see I've already set up an internal ALB, and so I have the ARN for that ALB and the ID of my existing VPC. I'm gonna run Terraform plan. Yep, sorry? Oh, I should, yep, and I need to refresh my AWS keys so you all get to watch me do that or not do that. Can you go black for a second on the projector? Okay, so let's try that again. Awesome, so uh, it's planning the Terraform module. I'll go ahead and run Terraform apply. And what I hope to show you with this is how easy it is. Lattice is a relatively new AWS product. But it's incredibly easy to get started uh, within uh, the new dedicated onboarding experience we've built into Studio. So I have an ARN here for an AWS resource share. And I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to head over to Studio. I'm going to create a new graph. And if you've signed up for serverless or a previous studio account, a uh, very common pattern is you enter the URL for your GraphQL endpoint. Uh, but in this scenario, my endpoint uh, isn't accessible. Here I can select the region. Today we're only in AWS. I'm gonna choose uh, US East 1 and enter my resource ARN. I link my resource. This is adding uh, our AWS account for dedicated to your Lattice network. I can click Next. And then I can provision my first subgraph. And I'm actually not going to go all the way through this process today. But what's so powerful about this is I'm very quickly creating a VPC peer between GraphOS Cloud Dedicated and my AWS account. What I wanted to show you is the new experience we've built in Studio or how we've upgraded it. You can see here that uh, the region uh, that I've selected, uh, US, US, in this case, EU West 1, the existing graph that I had. We have a new page here to observe cloud router performance. If you've previously used our serverless product, this was relatively opaque, and we're excited to bring uh, scaling and usage reporting uh, to Studio for the first time. So I touched on this a little bit earlier, but Supergraph uh, requests per second, subgraph fetches, and response size um, primarily influence throughput. Um, we looked at other things like subgraph latency and found those to not be very indicative um, of GraphQL load. Subgraph fetches is a good proxy for query complexity. So for example, uh, a query where you only have two subgraphs that you're resolving against will not have many subgraph fetches, but while the router is holding in memory or providing a query plan, it might resolve against eight subgraphs. Or if you have a very complex supergraph, maybe 60 subgraphs. That would theoretically decrease throughput. And so it's useful here to sort of see your performance over time. We're, we're obviously working to upgrade this experience, but just wanted to share a brief preview. Um, for now, we, have, we, we do not have auto-scaling, but you can manage capacity easily through the GraphOS interface um, and upgrade the uh, amount of throughput you have and the number of GCUs. So um, that's all I have for dedicated today to kind of show you an early preview. Um, I think we're ending a little early, but we, Brian and I would love to answer any questions you have um, about adopting GraphOS Cloud Dedicated or uh, you managing your own router fleet. Thank you so much.